Hello again everyone. I hope you're enjoying your day and have found out lots of things to help you. It's now time for the next session, Brain, Mood and Mental Health at Midlife with Kimberly Wilson, Chartered Psychologist. Kimberly Wilson is a Chartered Psychologist specialising in whole body mental health. She intends to transform the way we treat mental illness by integrating psychological therapy with evidence-based nutrition and lifestyle advice. Midlife is a period of profound psychological and emotional change. It's also a crucial time to start protecting your long-term brain health to reduce your risk of memory problems in later life. What's going on in the brain at midlife and what can you do to stay well mentally and emotionally? I'll leave you now with Kimberly to explain all. Thank you. All right. Um, I can't see myself, so I'm going to hope that everybody can see me. Is that all right? Um, hi everyone, my name is Kimberly Wilson. Uh, my introduction, <laughs> thanks Emily, thanks for the confirmation, a little bit confused, I thought I was all by myself in the room. Um, thank you very much. Um, I want to talk to you about brain and mental health. I think it's crucially important. I think it's an aspect of health that is always left as an afterthought. Whenever we think about health, we always consider prevention uh, as one of our main tools. Like the reason that we tell people to not smoke is to help prevent lung cancer. The reason that we, even if it's dental health, tell people to, to not eat sugary foods is to prevent cavities. But only with the brain, only with mental health, do we wait until a crisis hits and then act then we decide that it's worth investing in. Then we start thinking, okay, now something's gone wrong. Can we bring you back to baseline? Um, I think that is fundamentally flawed. I think it leaves a lot of people kind of, uh, kind of left to their own devices by themselves trying to work things out. I think the stigma around mental health and brain health means that people often leave symptoms a very, very long time before they start to address them because they think there's something that they should uh, try to deal with themselves. All of that is wrong. And what I want to be able to do is to help empower people to understand their brains a little bit better so that they know how to look after them. And so my information and my talks are always a little science-based, hopefully nothing too intense. Of course, I will take your questions at the end. But what I want you to, un to do is to understand that you have in your possession, in your head, the most complex organ in the universe and that it does a lot of very useful stuff it does a lot of not not so useful stuff but if you understand it and you understand how to look after it you will have the best chance of getting the most out of it so what I'm going to do is to share my screen now and take you through a little presentation about what happens in the brain at midlife this is going to be skewed uh, towards women uh, for reasons that will become evident as I go along all right So, hopefully you can all see a screen of presentation that says brain, mood and mental health at midlife. And uh, as we go through, I want to talk about the scale of the problem. So, most people, if I stopped you in the street and said, you know, what's the biggest cause of death or illness in the UK, most people would probably say cancer or heart disease or diabetes, all of which would be good guesses, but actually incorrect. The leading cause of death in the UK, outside of Corona times, I suppose, to be fair, is actually dementia. Dementia is our leading cause of death in the UK and the sixth leading cause of death in the West. So it's, it's strange to think that this is something that is killing more people than ever, but nobody really knows it and nobody really knows how to, uh, how to protect their brain health. At the moment, we're, we're sitting around 51, 53 million global cases, and that's due, it's predicted to increase to 150 million uh, by 2050. So not that very far away. And actually what's happening is that people are being diagnosed with dementia and Alzheimer's disease much, much younger. So it's thought less now to be a disease of aging as it had always thought to be, and is now considered a disease of lifestyle. Um, 
So more people die from Alzheimer's. I don't want to be too depressing, but I do want to get across the, the seriousness of, of what we're dealing with here. Uh, more people die from Alzheimer's disease than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. And similarly, the social care costs, so the cost to society, um, families, the, the healthcare system of dementia are larger than those attributable to cancer, heart disease and stroke combined. So it's a massive issue, yet it's one that is massively underfunded, not very well understood, and where there isn't a public health campaign to help people understand what's happening in their brains. At the moment, there isn't a cure for Alzheimer's and dementia, um, which is driving us. In fact, lots of the big clinical trials, lots of the big drug trials have failed quite spectacularly so now the science and the researchers are taking us back to prevention how do we understand what's happening in the brain how do we slow that brain aging how do we protect the brain from things that might be harming it how do we empower people to understand what they need to do on a day-to-day -day basis to help look after their overall brain health um, so it, as I say, it's not just because we're living longer, but here's what's really important to understand is that women have twice the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease than men. Um, and I'm sorry, I've assumed that everybody knows what Alzheimer's disease is. Um, so dementia is a range of syndromes of neurodegeneration, which means the loss and, and, and death of brain cells. And um, Alzheimer's disease is the main form of it. And it's associated mostly with uh, loss of memory, um, but also confusion, changes in personality, uh, increased aggression um, and other things until people are no longer able to care for themselves. So it's, it really steals people's final years from them and from their families. Um, and, and women are twice as likely as men to be diagnosed with it and not just because women tend to live longer than men. So <clears throat> why is midlife such a crucial time? Well, first of all, it's what we know about Alzheimer's disease and dementia in general, I'll just use the term dementia to, to cover these range of syndromes, is that although you're seeing the symptoms in usually the 60s and 70s, actually, if we were to, able to take a uh, like a, a little sample of your brain tissue, if you were able to look into your brain, the damage would be appearing in your 40s, so your late 40s and 50s. And the thing about these disorders is that the damage accumulates over time. And so it's actually your midlife health factors which are the key, key and crucial time to understanding your risk of Alzheimer's and dementia later on in life. And the risk to women seems to be independent of age, ethnicity, and the fact that women tend to live longer. So it's, it's not just that we're all living longer. It's not just that women are living longer. It actually seems to be linked to the hormonal changes that occur for women uh, during menopause and midlife. All right. And so why would that be? So the big focus in research at the moment is estrogen. So we will have heard of it all our lives. We think about estrogen in terms of, of periods and the menstrual cycle, the cycle in general, but actually estrogen is a real multitasker. It does a huge amount for us in the body and also in the brain. So that there are, so here is its other names, but there are receptors for estrogen all over the brain. And if you remember back to your, you know, your high school uh, biology lessons, we talk about um, a lock and key system for kind of enzymes and hormones and receptors. So estrogen is the key and the receptor is the lock and it and fits in. And there are receptors for estrogen in an area of the brain called the hippocampus, which is all you need to know about that is that's the center for memory. And the hippocampus is a part of the brain that is earliest and most severely damaged in Alzheimer's disease. Again, in an area of the brain called the hypothalamus. And again, all you need to know about that is that the hypothalamus is about body balance. It's about regulating your temperature, your appetite, your thirst, managing your sleep-wake system. Um, so estrogen plays a regulatory role there. The amygdala, which is your threat detection center, is the thing that tells you whether something is a danger or not. It's the part that becomes over and hyperactive in PTSD, for example. Um, in the brainstem, which regulates heartbeat and again, sleep. 
And in mitochondria, which you may not have heard about in a while, but mitochondria are the, we call them the powerhouse of the cell. They're like the battery of the cell providing energy for all of the cells and particularly in, in nerve cells. So all of your brain cells have a very, very high need for energy. Your brain uses 25% of your calories every day. So even though it's only about one or 2% of your overall body weight, it uses a huge amount of energy. So it's a very energy demanding type of cell. Um, and in particular, these powerhouses in the hippocampus, remember that area responsible for memory. So estrogen plays a role in all of these areas. And what's really important about this is that, as you can see, all of these areas and their functions map onto the symptoms of the menopause, right? So whether we're talking about hot flushes and that temperature regulation in the hypothalamus, and if we're talking about mood changes, because that's again, part of the limbic system, which is part of our emotion center. Um, fatigue and, and tiredness, which is associated to the mitochondria and energy production. So estrogen plays these really important roles throughout the brain. And so these symptoms that we associate with menopause aren't just about hormones, they're about the, the loss of hormones in the brain at menopause and through the menopause transition um, uh, through, through midlife. In addition, really important stuff for you to take away is that estrogen is neuroprotective. So as well as having a regulatory role in lots of these areas of the brain, it also has lots of neurological roles. So it protects brain cells. It is antioxidative. So it turns on enzymes that are that act as antioxidants and help protect the cell from oxidative stress. Um, I, maybe we'll do, I, I don't know if anyone has any questions about oxidative stress, we can look at those. Um, it increases brain blood flow, we call that perfusion, um, and thereby protecting from stroke. So one of the types of dementia is called vascular dementia, and it's associated to damage to the blood vessels, right? So your brain, as I say, has this huge energy demand, which has this, means it has a huge demand for um, a really strong blood supply because your blood provides you with the oxygen, the nutrients, the calories to fuel your brain. And so we want a very healthy, consistent blood supply going through your brain. And, and estrogen uh, has a couple of mechanisms to help keep those blood uh, vessels healthy and um, dilated wide and open so that blood can flow through. Um, it's anti-inflammatory and inflammation is an, an immune response, excuse me, it's an immune response um, and an, it can be an overactive immune response which when that happens can damage the brain and it's, uh, this just means it protects uh, the connections of your, of your brain cells where they send signals and it's neurotrophic which means it helps to build brain cells so there's lots and lots and lots of ways that this hormone that which we only ever associate with our periods is actually really important for our overall brain function and how we feel um, and it's one of the reasons that you know that the menopause and, and midlife should be taken much more seriously because what we're talking about is neurological changes in the brain not just um, some hot flushes um, or you know or someone feeling a bit tired these are quite serious concerns so all of these are features of brain aging. So neuroprotection, um, you know, neurological damage, oxidative stress, inflammation, um, neural atrophy. So the loss of brain cells are all features of brain aging. And this really tells us the really important role of estrogen in brain health and gives us a clue as to why women are at twice the risk of men because men don't lose their sex hormones as rapidly as women do that men men's testosterone does start to wane later off later on in life but much 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 more slowly all right so having um told you about the slightly depressing stuff i want to move uh, to the more optimistic information so we can't do anything about menopause but it is worth knowing that even given all of these risk factors, and even though the, the rates of Alzheimer's and dementia are due to triple in the next 30 years, dementia is not an inevitable part 
of aging. And that's not just me saying that, you can find that on the NHS website. It's not an inevitable part of aging. And that's really important because people tend to just think, you know, cross my fingers, hopefully I'll be okay, I'll get lucky. Um, you know, losing my marbles is just a part of getting old. It's, it's, it's really not. And our latest international research tells us that one in three cases of Alzheimer's disease could be prevented and that's a big word to use in scientific research um, but if people took the best case scenario if you took all the best information that was available from the clinical evidence then one in three cases so at the moment that would equate to about 50 million global cases of Alzheimer's disease could be prevented um, which would obviously be huge on a societal level it would be huge for families as well. So it's about getting that information out to people so that we understand the, the opportunity and the power in these uh, everyday kind of lifestyle interventions. Um, and just to talk about the, the kind of gap in knowledge, nearly half of us say that dementia is the disease we're most afraid of, right? So all of us are saying, well, you know, half of us are saying it's the thing that I'm most frightened of getting, but only 1% of people can name the seven known risk factors outside of, of menopause, right? So the, these modifiable risk factors. And um, so that's really telling us about this gap in knowledge. There's this wealth of information that's sitting in scientific literature that doctors and researchers are talking about between themselves, but it's not getting down to the public level. And so these are the risk factors, just because I wanted to, you to have them. Um, and these are midlife, as you see, they're midlife health factors. So um, type 2 diabetes, midlife high blood pressure, midlife um, central obesity, so particularly around the tummy and the middle area. Smoking, depression, that means just trying to have depression addressed as quickly as possible. It's not saying you can just stop your own depression. Um, but trying to make sure a depression is addressed as quickly as possible. Um, a sedentary lifestyle, a lack of mental stimulation because mental stimulation helps to turn on the chemicals in the brain that help to build more brain cells and protect the brain cells you already have. Um, and then in addition, hearing loss and social isolation. So um, both of these tend to be because either the stress of social isolation um, is negative, um, is, is harmful for the brain, but also because there's a loss of stimulation. All right. So the, we can't, there are things that we can't change. There are some genetic risk factors of less than 5% though of uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia are considered to be related to age, uh, to genetic factors. The rest are considered sporadic. So down to bad luck and or lifestyle. Um, and whilst we can't do anything about stopping the menopause, what we can do is really try to empower people with the information around prevention and protection. So prevention of neurodegeneration um, and protecting the brain throughout the lifespan. For me, I would want people to be doing this as early as possible, but certainly, certainly, certainly by midlife and around midlife, because as I said, that's when the damage starts to accumulate that you see in, sim in symptoms 20 years later. All right. So I'm going to take you through what those uh, demonstrated lifestyle uh, and modifiable risk factors. So I, you know, I've got kind of 15 more minutes, so I can't take you through them all, but I'm going to try and give you the big headlines um, so that you know a little bit. You can walk away today with a few practical things that you can put into place. So this is from, oh, just to say that this is one of my favourite quotes, nutrition is as important to psychiatry as it is to cardiology. And that's really telling us that, and, and us being the mental health professions and neurologists and psychiatrists and psychologists and neuroscientists that we really need to be considering nutrition much much more seriously and much much earlier when we think about brain health brain function mental health and emotional wellness all right so your brain on food so what we know is that there and and these 
largely attributed to the Mediterranean style diet. So the diet rich in, uh, the next slide will tell you about it, but lots of fresh fruit and vegetables, oily fish, uh, whole grains, that sort of thing. That sort of diet has been demonstrated to halt slow and in some cases reverse risk factors associated with dementia. So in this study, the Finnish ger Geriatric Intervention Study, they took a group of people who had what's called mild cognitive impairment, which is an early risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And they put it together in a kind of multimodal uh, intervention. So improve their nutrition, help them to get regular exercise, improve uh, their social uh, relationships, and um, supported them with uh, stimulation. And what we saw was a halting in their risk factors and some people saw improvements in their cognitive function. So really important and powerful and impressive results. Um, there's also a diet called the MIND diet, which is the Mediterranean DASH intervention for neurodegenerative delay. That's a, a kind of modified Mediterranean diet. And again, that reduced people's risk of developing dementia, even when they were already um, at elevated risk for the disease. Um, higher scores on a DII. So the DII is what's called the Dietary Inflammatory Index. And what it is, is really a, is a clinical tool for seeing how pro or anti-inflammatory someone's overall diet is. And what we see is that people, broadly the Mediterranean diet is, is lower, uh, is less likely to cause inflammation. The diet that is more likely to cause inflammation is obviously the kind of what we call the standard American diet or the very westernized diet, very high in processed foods, high in free sugars, high in salt. Um, and that's associated. So, so that gives you a higher score in the DII, that uh, Western style diet. And that gives you more markers of inflammation. It gives you more indications that you have this immune system response, which is potentially damaging to the brain. And it's associated with mild cognitive impairment, which, as I just said, is that that risk factor for Alzheimer's. Um, so more MCI and more dementia in women and poor memory and overall cognitive performance in the elderly. So this is one way that nutrition is, is such a powerful intervention to help protect your brain. And it's something that not enough people know or understand or certainly aren't thinking about early enough in life. People tend to wait until they start getting worried about their brain health so they feel like they're not quite as sharp as they were before and actually what i want people to be doing is thinking about this stuff much much earlier building resilience into the system helping to protect your brain now and build it up and make it strong so that you've got much more reserve and we'll get to the idea of cognitive reserve shortly um, going forward this is um, just a demonstration again of the power of food. So these are two mouse brain cells, um, just to, to be clear about that. And what this is, is uh, brain cells from the mouse, uh, the mouse baby of a mouse mother who was either fed enough essential fatty acids from oily fish or not enough essential fatty acids from oily fish in her diet and what you see here or what i'll show you is that so these are that this is the center of the cell like the, the nucleus of the cell but in the in the brains of the babies of the mothers who didn't have enough you have 50 percent fewer connections so essentially a smaller brain volume when there isn't enough essential fat in that maternal diet and that's because these fats form the outer membrane of, of all of your brain cells. The DHA in particular is 30, around 30% 30 of the outside wall of your brain cells. So if you're not getting enough of it, your brain is already struggling. We, we, uh, your body can't really make it very efficiently. You really have to get it from food or a supplement if you don't eat animal foods or fish. Um, but it's, it's so crucial to your brain health that it can literally change the shape of your brain if either you or your, your mother, when you, she was pregnant with you, isn't eating enough. In addition to that, in, in relation to what we're talking about in terms of estrogen, DHA, this essential fat that you get from oily fish, regulates an enzyme called a matter which regulates estradiol. So what they found, and these were in mass trials because it's, it's very difficult to uh, get the permission to do these trials in, in humans. Um, but what we see is that when we supplement with these essential fats, 
you get increases in this enzyme, which increases the available amounts of estrogen, right? And that's really important to what I'm talking about. So making sure you're getting enough of these fats can help upregulate the amount of estrogen production in the brain and can help to ensure that you're still getting these neuroprotective effects of estrogen, right? So, and again, the supplements of these oils turned up the expression of the antioxidants and help to protect the brain cells from damage. So I'm, if any of you follow me on Instagram, I'm always banging on about oily fish. I basically, I, I might, I should just make it my middle name. Um, but it's so important for so many different reasons. No one essentially is eating enough of them. But again, at midlife, it becomes particularly important because it's one of the regulatory molecules for your estrogen production. And we know how protective estrogen is. For the brain. Um, other foods in general, so the Mediterranean style diet is associated with a reduced risk of dementia for all of these reasons as well. So those phytoestrogens, phy phyto meaning plant estrogens from beans, legumes, seeds, whole grains and berries, um, the essential fatty acids from fish and seafood, increased production of nitric oxide, which is a compound that helps to widen and keep those blood vessels healthy, as I mentioned earlier on, um, particularly found in leafy greens and beetroot. Beetroot is a big source of um, uh, NO production. Um, and polyphenols, which by themselves, so those are the, the coloring compounds in brightly colored fruits and vegetables, tea, coffee, dark chocolate, and small amounts of red wine. Again, on my Instagram, I explained to my crew how much we mean when we say a small amount of red wine. It's really not very much, um, but it's thought to have some protective benefits. Okay, on to physical activity. And physical activity doesn't have to be structured exercise. It doesn't have to be you know, a HIIT training class. It's any bodily movement that produ produced by skeletal muscles that results in energy expenditure. So basically any, <laughs> any movement at all. Um, and it's a really powerful tonic for the brain and the brain at midlife. So we know, for example, that, so as you get older, your brain starts to shrink by about 1% a year. So from around midlife, so around your 40s, 50s, certainly by your 60s, your brain starts to shrink. I personally find this terrifying, um, but it's that shrinkage that's associated with the, the loss of memory, the, the slower performance, actually walking more slowly, because actually walking is quite a complex, complex activity. You have to keep your balance, you have to take in information from the visual field, you have to coordinate all of your muscles. And so the reason that older people tend to walk more slowly isn't just just because they're weaker, but it's because their brains are having to work that much harder to coordinate all of that, all of that movement and all of those, um, those features. Um, so your brain starts to shrink as you age. Physical activity, if you take away one thing from today, physical activity has been shown to help increase brain volume by one to two percent per year. So effectively halting and reversing age-related brain loss. I really want you to understand that physical exercise is one of the most robust ways we have of protecting our brain health. And we see that both in clinical trials, but also just in observational trials. People who do regular cardiovascular exercise have bigger hippocampi, that area of the brain that's so important for memory. Um, they have less brain shrinking, they have better cognitive control and memory and better attention. We know, and, and we don't use this word lightly in, in mental health, but we, a phys, a, aerobic exercise can prevent depression. So if we take a, a big group of people, let's say a, a thousand people and left to their own devices, 300 would get depression. If those 1000, these aren't the exact numbers, but just as a principle, if those 1000 all did regular exercise, a hundred of them would get depression. So 200 would be protected. We know that physical activity can reduce the severity of, and for some people prevent depression. And depression is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So it's something we really want to be thinking about. Resistance exercise, so it's not just about running, it's not just about 
you know, cycle and high intensity stuff, resistance exercise is really powerful because the same chemicals that cause your muscles to grow and get stronger cross into your, your brain and do the same for your brain cells. So they're able to cross in across the blood brain barrier into your brain and help turn on the, um, the growth signals for your brain cells and build those connections. So as I said, as I said earlier, weight training, um, reduces. So you take a group of older women and some of them weight train and some of them don't. And then you look at their brains, the ones who weight train have less damage in their brains than those who don't essentially. Um, there are improvements. So improvements in muscle strength correlate with improvements in cognitive function. So attention, focus, task switching, memory, all of those sorts of things um, in people with this risk factor for dementia so having bigger muscles is associated with having a better brain that's that's the kind of clear takeaway from there they also though specific to what we're talking about today have improved outcomes in alzheimer's disease assessments and improved function 18 months after follow-up so they retain these benefits it's so important um, that, that you see that they it, it's effective, it works acutely, but it, you also retain the benefits. You do have to keep doing it, but um, it's these are long-term effects. All right, I am whizzing through this. Um, walking, again, so if other forms of exercise are difficult for you, ex walking is still absolutely brilliant. And one of my favorite uh, studies that looked at this said, in one study, walking a, a mile a day, at least a mile a day, reduced risk of cognitive impairment, so that loss in brain function, by 50%, okay? Um, so, and in a prospective study, so when you take a group of people at baseline and you look at their brain function forward in life, those people who walked further had better, healthier brain matter volume, so the amount of brain matter nine years later, so a really long longitudinal study, and the amount of walking someone did was predictive of the health state of their brain nearly a decade later. Um, and in this one, exercise training, which is the one I referred to earlier, increased hippocampal volume by 2%, so that area of the brain important for memory, um, effectively reversing age-related volume by one to two years. Participants started, and this is just to make the point that it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to be running a marathon to get these benefits. In this trial, participants started by walking 10 minutes and increased their walking duration by five minute increments until they were walking 40 minutes um, three times a week. 40 minutes three times a week. All right, so not asking huge, huge amounts of, of movement from you. Just if you can just walk a little bit more, you'll be doing a huge amount of benefit for your brain as it tries to manage this transition through midlife. Um, I will very quickly go through uh, this one. So breath. One of the really important things to understand is that, that stress is a real uh, risk factor for, um, for, for neurodegeneration, for lots of kind of uh, neurological kind of chemical reasons. Managing stress then becomes really, really important and understanding how the nervous system works to switch you from a stress state into a more relaxed state is enormously important. And one of the best ways to do that is through controlled breathing through the nose. What that does, A, is activate a nerve called the vagus nerve, which is associated with um, your your resting state, your, your body when it's in a state of rest and a reduction of stress, but also breathing through your nose helps you to produce more of that nitric oxide, that gas that helps to keep those blood vessels nice and flexible. Um, so uh, I don't think I have time to go through that, but essentially um, the kind of breathing is called ujjayi breathing, the kind of breathing that you would do in a yoga class, so long, slow exhalation, breath through the nose, a constriction at the back of the throat, um, is the kind of breath that is associated with these effects. And in studies that's been found, stimulation of this nerve has been found to be potently anti-inflammatory, which is essentially what we want um, for the best protection for your brain. Um, so yes, just to say that, so it increases this uh, BDNF, which is that chemical that you also get from resistance exercise um, that turns on 
the, the growth factors in the brain. Um, and we found it helped reduce depression um, and increase the secretion of acetylcholine. And what's important about that is that the only treatments that we have for, there are only two drugs, uh, two drug types for um, dementia, and one of them uh, helps turn up acetylcholine. And so vagus nerve stimulation, this special type of breathing, can do that as well. <sighs> Rushing, <laughs> sorry if this is too fast, hopefully we'll get through to some questions. Um, so, cognitive reserve, this is the big principle that I talk about in the brain, and this is kind of just to show you what Alzheimer's looks like in the brain, so this is a healthy brain, this is quite a severe Alzheimer's case, so what happens is that you lose those connections, and when we talk about brain volume, this is what we're talking about. That's why I talk about prevention and protection, building up that brain volume. If exercise can help you build up a bigger brain, then that means that if and as when you do uh, start to have some problems, your brain is going to be much more resilient than if you hadn't been doing those practices. It's almost, I call it the pension plan for the brain for that reason, that if you start as early as possible, you can start building up a, a bank of healthy brain cells, healthy brain tissue, so that you've got more to draw on in your older years, and that's going to help protect you from, from these diseases of neurodegeneration. Yes, so that was the last slide. This is just, these are some of the other features um, that, that I talk about in my book, just in case that is useful to you. Um, and what I want to say is, yes, just to remind you that midlife is this crucial time for brain health and, and brain health risk reduction, that midlife, but it's essentially midlife heart health factors. So blood pressure, um, blood sugars, blood cholesterol, central adiposity are really, really important. So this is the time to get a grip on those, or to focus on them a bit more, trying to build in some little, small, everyday steps that you can. Um, we can't do anything about menopause um, yet. I wonder if people are working on it, but we can work on education, prevention, and protection and that's what we do with every other aspect of health that's what we do with cancer that's what we do with heart disease it's what we do with every other aspect of health but it's not yet what we do routinely for brain health and i think that should change um, and as i say the sooner you start the better but midlife is this crucial time and hopefully you have been able to take away a few practical little bits and bobs from that. So those are my deets. I will stop sharing now. I think that was the end. Um, and go to your questions. All right, let me just check the time here. All right, so I think we've got about seven minutes. <laughs> I feel like I've spoken at you at a rate of knots, but I really, I really care about this stuff and I really care that you get this information. So um, um, and obviously I'm going to try not I, to stick in my lane um, and try not to answer. If I can't answer it, I will let you know. Um, okay, so, so like this one. So the first one, um, I, have, I have to suppress estrogen due to breast cancer, but I have big concerns about this on my overall health. Any advice? So obviously I'm not an oncologist um, and the first information would be to just follow the, the, the details of the information of your oncology and um, care team. And hopefully what you, you'll have seen is that through that, um, through the presentation that there are other things that you can do. There are, you know, it's not all about estrogen, but it's about building in protection for the brain in other ways. There are so, estrogen is hugely important, but it, there are so many other ways that you can do it. Um, and, you can do tiny things every day. So in the back of the book, I've got a little, um, a check sheet, and it's also on my website, you can download it. It's just a checklist, and I ask you to do three things a day, and one of them is to eat a handful of nuts. One of them might be flossing your teeth. One of them might be going for a five minute walk. So they don't need to be um, difficult. They don't need to uh, take up lots of time. Most of them are free or very, very low cost, and it's just about, trying to build in lots of different protective strategies um, for you and for your brain. Um, 
is it already too late at 56 for preventative measures? No, it's absolutely not. What's fantastic about the brain is that it's, it's considered plastic, which means it's moldable and able to be shaped by experience. That's the reason that we can still learn things later on in age. And actually it's really, really important to keep trying to learn things later on in age in order to help you turn on those growth factors in your brain. So no, whilst I've been talking a bit about midlife, um, because that's the, the title of the, the, the whole day, um, it is never too late. And you know, I want you to start as early as possible, but it is never too late because the brain is still plastic, it's still alive, it, it still has this capacity to grow. And so, you know, those, those exercise trials that I mentioned, they were already, most of them with older people. So people in their 60s, 60 plus. So no, go for it. You can keep going um, and you will still get those benefits. Um, does HRT boost estrogen sufficiently to protect against dementia? The jury is currently out on that. And that's just around the complexity of different types of HRT tra treatments, right? So there are different forms of the estrogen, of, of synthetic estrogen. Um, there are different dosages. They are applied at different durations. And then they are applied at different stages in, um, in menopause. So it's possible and researchers are looking at that, but they really need to nail down all of those features. What form, um, how long, uh, and what, what duration and what dosage. So the jury is still out on that one, I'm afraid. If you don't eat fish, I read that hemp oil is better than cod liver oil for omega-3s, which would you recommend? Actually, neither. What I would recommend if you don't eat fish is that you go to your health food store and you ask for an algae-based DHA supplement that has at least 500 milligrams of DHA per dose, right? So um, the algae are where the fish get it in the first place. The algae are the ones that synthesize the omega-3. When you get it from the fish, you get it with some other important proteins that help prevent against Alzheimer's disease. But if you don't eat fish, then I would be saying going to your, your health food store and having an algae base. So that, that stuff that grows on top of ponds, <laughs> an algae based DHA supplement with at least 500 milligrams per per daily dose. Um, if you don't eat fish, but don't mind having a fish oil, then my preferred, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, but I'm gonna say it. My preferred supplement is either Nordic Naturals. I personally use Wiley's um, and it's, it's a lemon flavored uh, liquid oil and you have a teaspoon a day and that has about 800 DHA and about 1300 EPA, so. Um, how much oily fish do you recommend, i.e. half a tin of mackerel a, a week? Um, all of the researchers that I've spoken to, um, and I spoke to some who deal specifically with the role of omega-3 in, in brain development and neurodegeneration, they basically say as much as you can. So they were having two or three, portions, two or three cans um, of oily fish a week. Essentially, I much of the research says about a gram, which would be 1000 milligrams of omega-3s, EPA and DHA per day, which is why I say at least 500 of just the DHA. Um, let me check the time. Two minutes. Um, would doing body weight training be sufficient or is it really weight training only? No, body weight training counts. Anything that's putting resistance on the muscle. So press ups, pull ups, air squats, um, really as long as you're pushing the muscle that's going to do it for you so it doesn't have to be like physically lifting dumbbells or kettlebells if you're doing that, that that's why yoga can be really good for this because you know when you if you do yoga and you go down into chaturanga and then you're pushing back up and you're doing all sorts of or you're holding these stress positions which are building uh are putting resistance on the muscle and building muscle they all work as well so yeah all, all good um, is there a guide to how much cardiovascular exercise is needed? Pilates and yoga is always recommended for midlife and I think cardiovascular exercise is often forgotten. Um, I would go then with the NHS recommendations, which is something they, they break it down into kind of 175 minutes and that's made up of like three lots of 30 minutes of moderate exercise and da, 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 da. basically a combination. You want to cover your basis. So if you want to, you know, have 
if you look at that trial and say a 40 minute walk three times a week, then that would be considered your aerobic exercise because that would be pushing um, your blood, uh, your cardiovascular system as opposed to building muscle. So you might want to have a couple of long walks and then have a, you know, a yoga or a resistance training session as well. So a combination as much as possible. Someone, I saw a question ask about Sudoku and those brain training games. The best research at the moment suggests that they're just good at training you to be better at those games. They don't tend to generalize to better brain health overall. Um, the things that generalize are learning um, and particularly learning that uses a couple of different disciplines. So if you were to learn to dance, for example, what you'd be learning is both how to listen to music and interpret music at the same time as working on your balance, at the same time as learning the steps and, and the formation. And it's that combination that will generalize to better brain health, for example, or say learning a new language, you know, anything that's about learning rather than these brain training games um, tends to generalize better in terms of brain health. Um, is it ever too late again? No, it's not. Get going. Um, which supplements are good for vegans for a healthy brain? So I think I've answered that one. Does regular sex help? Sure. Yes or not? <laughs> I think regular sex helps everything. So um, go for it. <laughs> um, all right okay so we've made a note of all the questions so we'll look to do okay that's fine so i think i am being invited to wrap this up um and so i will thank you for your kind attention um lots of resources and stuff on my page and everything and more that i've spoken about today is in the book um, I've tried to make the book as comprehensive as possible. I wanted to answer all of your questions, including working on your relationships, understanding your emotions, dealing with money, all of that stuff. So um, everything that I've said here incredibly fast, <laughs> you will also find there. Thank you, Kimberly. Oh my goodness, that was amazing as always and really enlightening. There are so many things I didn't know and so many things I want to do now to protect my brain health. Um, and your passion for it is just uh, amazing. You know, what you said about campaigning to make sure people knew about this, it's so, so important. And I think a lot of people have, have felt that and I've seen lots of the comments. So thank you so, so much. Um, and as Kimberly mentioned about her book, when you get your email about your digital goodie bag, there's some information about the book and how you can get it and everything in there. So um, you'll get that information then. So thank you. Um, the next session will start at 4.30 and is a panel talk on perimenopause and menopause. So hormone havoc, what's going on? Perimenopause, menopause, HRT and other treatment options explored. So tune in at 4.30 and I'll see you then. Thank you.